Hello. Hello from the lockdown. <coughs> Can I invent that as a sign? Can we start doing that? <coughs> Our solidarity in lockdown. <coughs> Today I'm talking to you about death, specifically the death of an animal, more specifically still my beloved pet cat Morrissey, but I think many of the things that I share may be relatable to death more generally, although of course I'm not suggesting that my personal loss is as painful as your loss, particularly if we're comparing an animal to a human. But to speak about this on purely personal terms, I've never been more affected by a death in my life and I've been quite lucky. I mean, as a drug addict, I know lots of drug addicts that have died and you become somewhat inured to the death of drug addicts, but both my parents are still alive, thank God, and I've never had uh, deaths in the other direction. I've lost friends, of course, but the death of my beloved cat, Morrissey, it reached deep inside me and affected me viscerally. His, the death as it was impending, I was away in another country, I thought, I'll do whatever I can to delay and obviously, hopefully, prevent this death. But we know, don't we, that in the midst of life we are in death, you know, that death is coming, that every pet we die, every child we have, every grandparent we have, everything is due to die. The great earth itself one day will be naught but a vast expanse of nebulous gases impossible to read. And do we rehearse this great event in every fatality that we experience and perhaps could it be said even every time we say goodbye. Morrissey was due to be put down due to renal failure and to watch his slow senescence was a sad thing to endure. Because I suppose this cat, this cat Morrissey, my cat, I'd had him for 16 and a half years and when I got him I lived in a one room flat in Gospel Oak, North London and this cat traversed oceans with me and lived with me in like maybe 10 or 15 houses, was there on my lap when I watched myself as main stories on the news, Ding, Russell Brand destroys the BBC, you know, that, remember that crazy event? Or I remember when Ed Miliband was in the house, the cat coiling up the stairs. I remember various people of notoriety and high public profile being in the house and the cat coiling about and it's commonly understood that I went through a pretty hedonic epicurean lifestyle phase for a while and Morrissey my cat was the silent presence ghosting about through that house always there and like with you with your pets in the wordlessness there is a different kind of love a deeper kind of connection look at my uh, facility with language I can talk you can talk we all got words at our disposal but in that perfect silence with the animal is a connection to I would argue something deeper why did we domesticate animals? Check out um, Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about the domestication of wolves. He tracks that quite beautifully from sort of Stone Age into connectivity with wolves to our current domestication of uh, dogs and the various breeds. Brilliant, brilliant to watch. Neil deGrasse Tyson, of course, a great guest on Under the Skin. If you've not subscribed to that, you probably could. But like, what intrigues me is the totemic origins of pet keeping. Once we herded, corralled, paddocked and kept livestock, we had a different relationship with nature. Once we grew crops in one place, we had dominion over the soil and over the beast. Because prior to that, the hunter-gatherers that we were knew that we were in constant symbiosis with our quarry, with the animals that we killed. And we painted them on cave walls and we wore their skins and the buffalo was made sacred and was the subject, of course, of buffalo dance, buffalo myths, buffalo stories. We knew that we were one with the animals. And as slowly we became stripped and by stripped by time, industrialized, urbanized, placed in conurbations and concrete 
comfortable prisons. We look to reach out and recreate our indigenous conditions where possible. The pet is totemic, a totem as in totem pole, a representation of our connection to nature and Morrissey became the god of myself, the god of my self-realization, the deification of who I am, to become sacred, to consecrate, to not live the ordinary normal life of chomping on chocolate or staring at screens or standing in line or being on escalators and living the lives that they want you to but to have some ordained connection, something deeper, something in nature. And when he died, I howled. I felt a cry come out of me. I heard my own crying from inside my head and thought, I've never heard that before. I've never heard myself cry as a man. And like anyone I've been through, tragedy and challenge and heartbreak and loss. But this noise, this noise that came out of me shocked me, the catharsis, the pain of it. Even in his passing, he offered me a further act of friendship. The vet was due to come. And they say that the death from renal failure is an ugly one, seldom ends in cardiac arrest, a sort of quiet and gentle death, at least for those observing. It leads more commonly to organ failure, that kind of death, you know. And Noel Fitzpatrick, aka Supervet, the TV vet, animal genius, lunatic, and wonderful human being explained to me that in the case of renal failure, the most likely outcome would be a kind of drowning, drowning, a kind of breathless asphyxiation. I thought, oh man, I can't have that for Morrissey. Or, but I wanted to keep him alive as long as possible, feeding him through a tube, keeping him in my room, watching him make the small journeys from our bed to the litter tray, never eating food, everything, some sort of a smell I'll remember forever, nutritious paste injected into a tube in his neck, stitched to his skin under a collar thing that I didn't like seeing him wearing. He's such a dignified and cool cat. Didn't like to see him strapped up like that. Not so bad as the cone. We all want to leave that alone, but to sort of just see him restricted, I didn't like it. And I made my own one, a thinner one, you know, like a, just a sort of a thin one. This happened during lockdown, so I got time to make little things. Did you hear that Roald Dahl once invented some sort of like valve for the heart? Yeah, Roald Dahl, BFG. He's one of his kids got sick and he went, well, I couldn't make this thing, couldn't I? Like, and he made some sort of heart valve. What mad genius that dude was me. I was pretty pleased to cut one of those stretchy bandage things. Like, actually, my wife done it, Laura done it. Cut one of it, oh, but it was my idea. It was my idea to do something. I was remembering the Steve Jobs of the project. Like, hey, why don't we have like iPhones? Oh, okay. Uh, right, yeah, good. Get out of my way. Like, um, so we like uh, made that thing and put it on him and that gave him sort of some comfort. But I realized what, you know, something about death. When I was a younger man, a man that talked a lot of ending my own life, felt a lot of pain and sadness and self-destruction, death was somehow explosive, not slow sort of withering erosion. To dying in the continuous form means the sort of retraction of life. Now he can't walk to the litter tray. Now he can't hop up onto the bed. A sort of a slow closing down till he's just still on a cushion most of the time. And when a few things happen that would compromise his dignity, my missus goes, we've got to make the phone call. And I couldn't take the theatre of it, you know, the theatre of the ding dong, the vets here, the scythe bearing super vet about to administer tickets for the final journey. I couldn't take it. But, you know, as a pet owner, which seems like a kind of reductive term for what I felt was an osmosis between me and him, a self-realisation. When I found that cat, when that found me, when I was, I was just a kid, 27, but just a kid, and now I'm a father with two daughters. I'm a man grounded in who I am, and a significant part of that was not just his catalytic, catalytic presence, but what I learned from care for him care for him and duty, you know, and from his elegant manner and from his way, his beautiful way. So I was like, okay, yeah, we'll make the phone call, made the phone call. I'll come at eight after the kids are abed, said the vet. And so I just spent the rest of the afternoon in the room with the cat waiting, waiting and watching, texting people that I've known for a long time, like, oh, you know, Moz, yeah, he's on the way out and got sort of messages and memories from people that loved him. And then like while I was doing that, I sort of noticed his little paws like 
a couple of twitches. I noticed a couple of like sort of minor little gasps. And I'm noticing even now the beautiful blue tip on the tree behind me and the reflection right there. And I notice that what they give you is a kind of 5G interconnectivity to the sacred. The neglected and forgotten sacred can be found in your connection to the animal. You can find yourself through your relationship to an animal and through any form of love and through, you know, connection to nature, this disconnection from nature. But we're having time to contemplate and reflect on now that nature, if indeed nature it is, has bitten back in microbial swarms. So he, um, yeah, I looked at him and he, his little bare rib cage from various operations and procedures had stopped shifting. I'd never seen no pain, a sign of pain or distress. I, I was told to expect those and it was that that made me make the eventual phone call. Never saw anything, no wail or tortured noise. I wouldn't be able to stand that. I would have pressed the euthanasia, euthanasia hotline button as soon as there was any indication of that. But I looked at him and he was gone. And the first thing I felt was relief. And like his final act of friendship to me was to pass in a manner that spared me the opera of his own demise, spared me like uh, the conversations of we had to do it, didn't we? We had to do it. It was the right thing to do, wasn't it? Relieved me of all of that in one final honouring. Me and the missus, like, I went downstairs, told her, we showed the kids, my mad, toddler, trickster, three-year-old says some profound, prophetic things. Ah, oh, she looked at my face, she'd never seen me cry, looks at me sort of like a mystery, you know. My other daughter, she's too young to, you know, everything to her is an innocent delirium. And then I showed the, like, they go stiff fast, these animals, man. We took out that tube. That was a rough moment to snip and pull that out. I showed the other animals, Bear looks in wonder, our other cat, Jericho, aware of what death is on some deep, wordless level, the level of instinct and gut and evolution. Then we done the burial and it was beautiful and sacred and we lit candles and we said prayers and... The ritual performed its function and the death seeped into me. The death seeped into me. There can be a disembodiment to death and to loss, a refusal, trauma, a breaking of the path, a breaking of the line, a breaking of the connection. But due to the spiritual lessons I have been given, and I'm aware that at this time in particular, many of you will be dealing with the loss of human beings that are integral to you, that you deeply, dearly love, losing people too soon. Too soon, it always seems too soon, huh? And you might think, wow, this is a long eulogy for a cat, but to me, he was more than that. To me, he was, what is love other than an acknowledgement of oneness, an acknowledgement of union? I feel for you, there's, as I would feel for me, I would, don't want anything bad to happen to you. I want to protect you. I'm prepared to give up something of mine in order that you succeed. Like I heard, the only demonstration of love is sacrifice. All else is but affection. That's so good then. It's not mine though. Um, yeah, and um, through that love, through that love, there is connection, there is interconnectivity. And, but through the pain of the loss, a deeper kind of a connection, a sort of solidifying of our family, few at, through our improvised funeral amidst the candles in our garden with our other cat coiling around, we were able to process, realise and experience the death and somehow embody it. So whilst it's very sad, because that cat, he was always there, man. That cat's been through everything with me. He's given me everything that he needed to give me. And I hope that when I, like you, in, unless I die first, endure the death of everybody else, that I'm able to apply the lessons taught to me, given to me by the death of my dear cat, Morrissey. And I hope that any of you that are suffering loss, whether it's due to the pandemic or just due to the everyday inevitability of that painful severance of death, of loss, that you are able in your own way to find what's sacred in it and through the sacred discover that 
there is a oneness that underscores, underwrites, and in my view is the crucible of all creation. So there is never an ending or a separation. Merely new notes are played in the great ongoing symphony of existence in which we all play our parts.